But just a few days ago, I was watching a very popular finance channel talk about how much he hated index funds. He thought they were boring, he thought they were for people who wanted to give their money away to someone else to manage, and he said that they only delivered average results. He pretty much said that people who choose to invest in them are stupid. Are you stupid? Funny thing is, these criticisms and complaints are actually nothing new. The world of index fund investing has always had its critics ever since its creation, especially from much larger and more powerful institutions on Wall Street. There are literally billions of dollars at stake here from people used to making a lot of cash from managing your money. Show me the money. But what's the real truth behind index fund investing? And why is there still so much hate and distrust? I thought the case was already put to bed. Seems like the battle has begun again. So let's take this one out to the courtroom and figure out who's right and who's wrong. But first, just like a villain from your favourite superhero film, we've got to go back in time for a history lesson to understand what has made index funds what they are today and why they might actually be a little misunderstood. The world of investing has changed massively since the middle of the 20th century, which really isn't that long ago. For index funds, there weren't really many options for investors. You'd have to try and pick individual companies to invest in and build your own portfolio of stocks and bonds and don't forget that most people had no access to the market or, quite frankly, never even touched the stock market. Most people were left pretty scared off from the events of the Great Depression of the 1930s, although saying that most people never even own shares. According to the data from the New York Stock Exchange, back in 1952, only 4.2% of the US population were even owners. Mutual funds and then index funds later on from the 1970s really changed the game for investors and allowed the average person like you and me to really get access to that previously shady world of the stock market. No more high broker commissions, no more crazy fees, and no more having to worry if you picked the right company before you wanted to try and get to bed at night. An index fund worked by owning shares in every company on the stock market, weighted according to the size of the company. No active stock picking, no trying to time the market, just a straight up copy of the index and bigger companies got more of the money and then smaller ones got less. Pretty simple. The very first index fund was the Vanguard 500 index, which as the name gives away was the index fund that copies the famous S&P 500 index, which is the largest 500 companies in the US. It didn't actually start off with great excitement and in fact it struggled to gain money from investors with only about $11 million put in when it opened. History though would do the rest of the work for it and today index funds control around 17% of the total stock market making it a multi-trillion dollar industry. But why do they get so much hate at the time and why do they still get given a bad name by some parts of the investing community? Welcome to the murky world of the stock market and investing. You know the saying when you want to find the cause behind something that you just need to follow the money? Well, this is one of those stories. The growth of the passive index fund and ETF market ripped away billions of dollars of fees and commissions from the fat cats on Wall Street and they weren't going to let Bogle and the Vanguard group get away with it. You see, Here's how mutual funds worked and still do to this day. Firstly, you've got a fund manager, or even more than one. They want to make sure they get paid and get rewarded, especially if they manage to make some good stock picks. There's fees to get into a fund called a load, which could be anything from 1% to 4% of your money, and that's all charged up front for the courtesy just for getting in. And then you've got all your ongoing charges, which get removed from the value of your holdings each year. Now, although these fees have been falling over the years, mutual fund costs were often above 1% per year, and sometimes you even got performance fees on top of that, if they did exceedingly well. Compare those managed costs to the average one of the passive index fund, and this is where the big differences come in. The average passive index fund only has ongoing costs of around a fraction of a percentage. Let's take an example from the Vanguard UK website. If you look at the popular S&P 500 index fund that I hold myself, which sells under the ticker symbol VUSA, the charges are just 0.07% per year. We then grab the average ongoing cost of an actively managed mutual fund, we're looking at something more like 0.75% to 1%. Well, so what? 1%? That's nothing. That's just one cent for every dollar invested. That's hardly anything, right? Well, not so far. The issue with fees is that they add up over time, and a 1% fee against an investment of, say, £10,000 over 30 years will cost you £50,000. Yep. It's not an incorrect calculation, go try it yourself. Do a 10% return against a 9% return over 30 years with that £10,000, and that number really is just under 200k return versus 150k. It's crazy. All right then, we've not actually dealt with the issue at hand here. At the start of the video, I said that a popular finance YouTuber reckoned that the only stupid people gave their money away to index fund managers. First up, passive index fund investing has no manager actively doing anything. So their first point is totally misplaced a passive index fund places its funds according to the size of the companies in that index. Biggest companies get the biggest share of the fund, and this means at the time of filming, of course, you've got all the world's largest companies like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Amazon, and Google, and they all get, of course, the lion's share 
of an index. And then everyone else gets their fair share below. As they get smaller and smaller, they get less of the fund and less of the index. And also as companies fall into or outside of the index, then they'll get added or removed. The index is self-cleansing, kind of in the same way as your dog does it, but I'll leave that to your imagination. Secondly, they said that index funds only deliver average results. Now, this is a really interesting point because the word average sounds rubbish, doesn't it? Nobody wants average results. We want to beat the market. We want to 10x our money. The issue is the way it's understood. Let me explain and run the numbers and we'll have a look. Let's say the stock market delivers 10% back this year. As an index fund investor, we will get our 10% minus any fees. Told you this is why they're so important. We can keep these low. We'll get back, say, 9.93% or maybe just a smidge under. The issue is the average investor doesn't get anywhere near those levels of return. Why? Because we're human. Our emotions get in the way. We chase winners, we sell on the way down, and we buy on the way up. We try to time the market, find the next sure thing, or put too much of our money into one company, which ends up doing really badly. All along the way, this costs us money in trading fees, time wasted, and ultimately reducing our returns. In fact, according to the data, the average investor returned 5.96% over the last 20 years, even when the S&P 500, which we'll call the market, delivered 7.43%. So the average investor making average returns actually delivers less than the average. This means that by using index funds and passively investing, your returns, although they are average versus the market, are actually way above average compared to the real investor. Remember how much 1% cost us in the previous example? Or just remember the next time that you invest in a company making no profit, hoping that your luck's about to change. Think about it. And even professionals struggle to beat the returns of the market people with teams of analysts and some of the smartest employees on the planet. In the short run across a year or two, you can get some pretty crazy results, but in the long term, you're looking at single digits of funds and people who manage to beat the market. And even then, they might win by just a few percentage points. Is it really worth all of the stress trying to pick all of the winners in your portfolio? Or should you really have just a much smaller portion of your money in individual companies? all up to you. Funds which do extremely well in one year, those with active managers, almost always fail to deliver the same results in the year after. I mean, just look at managers like Kathy Wood at the moment, who had an amazing couple of years with ARK Invest, but has since had a much more challenging time recently. Do you really think the average ARK Investor has made money, or did they only buy once the fund was doing really well, and then have sold on the way down? I think you already know the answer. Warren Buffett's got a great quote about this behaviour. He said that a fat wallet is the enemy of superior returns. Here's a great clip also from John Bogle being interviewed when he talks about how people behave when they're buying into funds which are performing really well. They were bearish when they should have been bullish and bullish when they should have been bearish. So the index at least uh, steers a steady course. I can't put it better myself. Okay, so it almost sounds too good to be true. Why doesn't everyone just use passive index funds and invest like that? Well, it's not as simple and there are some downsides. It's worth addressing those as well now. As more people invest into index funds, they're weighted by the size of the company. More and more money gets pumped into the already large companies we see in the stock market. Apple, for example, gets more and more of your money. So if you do invest every month, some people argue that this interferes with the open market and it makes it more inefficient. But let's get real. Although passive index fund investing is a massive market, it's only still a fraction of the overall market. We're not quite got to the position where people don't try their luck on the stock market individually just yet. Secondly, and probably the most important issue, which is of genuine concern, is the voting power and concentration of ownership. Here's the best way to explain this. If on the S&P 500, you've got loads of companies that compete with each other, and some are in the same sector, but you as the mutual fund company own all of them and have a big stake, where's your incentive to help grow that company? And you've got major conflicts of interest if you're a major shareholder in say both Visa and Mastercard, for example. I mean, take a look at here at Microsoft stock ownership and you'll see the beginnings of what might be a very difficult problem for the regulators to solve. The top owners of the companies are, of course, the mutual fund providers, led by Vanguard, followed by BlackRock and State Street. Between them, they own more than 15% of the company. In the future, if mutual fund providers start to get too big, then things might have to change. But for now, it's just a problem waiting to happen as you can't have corporate America be controlled by just a few individuals and companies, but we'll kick that can down the road. So what's the conclusion here then? The truth is that index fund investing into passive, low cost, broad market investments beat stock market picking over the long term for the vast majority of people and even the professionals. The problem is, us humans don't really care about the facts. We think we're better than everyone else and we can be that 5% of people who beat the market. We get especially cocky once we've had a really good year or we pick a great stock. I mean, just look at Tesla, for example, who's made a lot of people very rich in a very short period of time. Or even some other small cap growth stocks who, with all of the money from stimulus and money printing, soared them to record values. 
I mean, even companies not producing anything became multi-billion dollar valuations. It's a bit crazy. So there is a balance to be had then. The main thing is that now you know how hard it is to beat the market and that passive investing delivers much better than average results. The choice is yours and how you want your own investments to look. How much of it should remain passive and how much of it do you want to tinker with? Are you wanting to put in the work to research companies, look at balance sheets, find the winners, or are you too busy like most people just getting on with your lives and work and not having to worry about nonsense like that. The problem is, of course, you've got people on platforms like YouTube telling you that it's easy to pick the winners because look, they've done it for two years in a row. Just ignore the fact that their portfolios have been massively hit recently and are incredibly risky. They know better because they've been investing in a bull market and stocks only go up, even the bad ones. I mean, if you just pay a few thousand dollars for a course, then surely you'll be set for life once you follow the investments, right? I'll leave that one up to you guys, but come on, get your head screws back on. If you do want to get started investing, please feel free to check out all the other videos I've done on the topic. I'll actually pop the playlist link on screen now to everything I've done, all of my beginner stuff that I've done to get yourself invested at the start of 2022. Anyway, I hope you find that useful. With all that said, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Drop me a like if you have, subscribe for many more, and I'll see you in the next one. And as always, happy investing.